Hello and welcome to our lecture on Chapter 8 in Bacterial Genetics. We're going to take a look today at some mutations and repair mechanisms that different bacteria use. Uh, in order to evolve, since bacteria actually are, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Since bacteria uh, uh, reproduce through binary fission, which is really essentially a type of cloning, right? They're copying everything. No, there's no mixing of genetic material. Bacteria have to find other ways to uh, evolve, right? Evolution is really based on changes in genetic patterns. So this is referred to as horizontal gene exchange. And bacteria utilize three different forms of bacterial gene exchange. They use uh, conjugation transformation and transduction. Um, oftentimes, in addition to their own horizontal gene exchange, some of that can be regulated uh, or uh, stimulated through environmental factors. So lots of different environmental factors can contribute to evolution of new bacterial strains, such as presence of an antibiotic or changes in temperature, salinity, uh, nutrient contents, as well as that horizontal gene exchange that occurs between uh, bacteria. Prokaryotic organisms oftentimes evolve past the genus species level into what we call subspecies or even down into sub subspecies, which may be like strains of E. coli, um, strains of uh, Vibrio cholerae. So there can be multiple bacteria of the same species that have very uh, minor genetic differences, but those minor genetic differences can evolve those organisms to be quite deadly. Uh, here in the bottom left, we just have kind of, this is a little cladistic uh, diagram, a cladogram that is showing, it's tracing MRSA. Uh, when MRSA started back in the United States, it was a nosocomial infection found almost only in hospitals. It quickly became part of normal flora in general population outside of the hospital as well. And this is just a little tree showing the evolution of um, antibiotic resistance occurring in that MRSA strain over time. And then over here, we have a quick little, uh, just a quick little video of a gentleman talking about um, the evolution of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. The bug has this sort of this intrinsic or innate programming to try to survive, like all of us. That's what we do as living organisms. Uh, and the best way we learn how to survive is through adaptation. So Darwin's, you know, the, the thing that we all learned in high school, you know, survival of the fittest, it's true, but it's really survival of the most adaptable. Uh, and that's really what resistance is about. This is purely a numbers game. And so when you do give uh, a certain antibiotic and say you don't, you, you start missing your pills, so you're decreasing the dosing, then your killing is inefficient. Right? And when you have inefficient killing, you have more rounds of replication. The bugs are allowed to persist longer. And the longer a bug persists, they multiply. Right? So an average bacteria like E. coli, for example, or staph, will double every 20 minutes. Right? So every time it doubles, and then, you know, it's a, you know, you know, one to two, two to four, four to eight, so on and so forth, right? There's chances of mutations, chances of events happening where the bug is allowed to adapt. So what is this gene exchange or genetic change that occurs in bacteria for evolution of these strains throughout um, through time and in, in different environments. So we have, of course, a genetic change. And again, this can be the result of horizontal gene transfer. And in this particular instance, we are talking about transformation conjugation. There is another form of gene transfer called transduction. Uh, transduction is a form of horizontal gene transfer, but it's also that horizontal gene transfer is due to a mutation. So I kind of listed it uh, under both there. Now, in transformation, bacteria will take up DNA from their environment. So they will become what we call competent cells, and they'll absorb DNA that they come across in an environment. Uh, hand sanitizers help promote transformation between bacteria. Uh, because living organisms on your hands come into contact with dead bacteria that are on your hands. And that DNA that's left behind can be taken up by living bacteria and they'll kind of scan it and say, hey, does this work for me? And if it has a gene in it that is beneficial, they'll keep it. 
Conjugation is where we go back to unit one. We were talking about structures in bacteria and we were talking about the pili. Uh, pili are specialized fimbriae structures that are used for attachment, but they are also hollow tube-like structures where bacteria will make a copy of their genetic information. They'll move that genetic information across the pili uh, through that tube to a receiving cell, a recipient cell. And that recipient bacteria cell will now take in that copy of plasmid, or at least a piece of it, and incorporate it into its own genome. So that genetic exchange has occurred, but there's no third cell as a result. So it's not sexual reproduction, it's just horizontal gene transfer. Um, mutations can um, uh, a result, uh, be the result of transduction. And in transduction, Instead of the genetic exchange occurring between two bacteria, the, the DNA exchange occurs due to a viral infection of the bacteria. Now we're going to learn in our next unit about uh, bacteriophages, which are viral infections of bacteria. And when these viruses introduce their DNA into the bacterial cell to try and take it over to make more viruses, sometimes that DNA will go dormant, become part of the genome of the bacterial cell for a short period of time. And this can introduce mutations into the genome of the bacteria. During binary fission, those mutations will get spread from one generation to the next. That's the short version of what happens with phage. Um, this can later result in vertical transfer during binary fission. So we create entire populations that have, um, that have this whatever mutation has been introduced. But another form of genetic change would be an induced mutation. Um, and these are just simply mutations that occur in the genetic sequence, not due to any form of horizontal gene transfer. The concept of genotype and phenotype is also, just like it's important in eukaryotic organisms, it is important in bacteria. Uh, when we study bacteria and we try to identify them and learn about them, we oftentimes really concentrate on their metabolic properties. We don't know, we can't really see a whole lot in, inside of the bacterial cell like we can inside of a uh, eukaryotic cell. So we rely on metabolic characteristics. What can an organism break down? What can it not? And bacteria have a just unending array of different metabolic activities. So when we talk about genotype and phenotype, the genotype of a cell is its genetic makeup. And the phenotype is what the, that genetic makeup results in. So we think of phenotype maybe as what we see, but phenotype is also what that cell produces. So if a cell is able to metabolize a particular sugar, like lactose, we talk about the lac operon, the genotype is that the cell actually has the lac operon, has the, the genes to break down lactose. The phenotype is its actual fermentation of lactose, those enzymes that get produce, produced because of that genotype. We use growth factors to um, study different types of mutations and uh, expression in genotype phenotype. Now, growth factor requirements are when we see a, um, let's say, uh, uh, the lac operon gets mutated. We didn't know that that was the lac operon. We just saw this genetic sequence, and so we disturb or knock out that genetic sequence through mutation and then observe to see if some kind of metabolic property has changed. So in that case, before the mutation, the bacteria could ferment lactose, and now after the, after the mutation, the bacteria cannot. And that uh, type of study would tell us what the responsibility is of that gene, what the, the product or function of that gene would be. Uh, some terms to remember are oxytrophic and prototrophic. Now, an oxytrophic organism is one that when we grow it on agar, when we grow it in the laboratory, we have to add a specific uh, growth factor because the gene or the genotype of that particular organism has been mutated to remove that growth factor. Uh, we did uh, talk about the lac operon. There's another uh, uh, operon that bacteria use called the trip operon or TRP for tryptophan. Bacteria are responsible for producing their own tryptophan. They don't really take in tryptophan and process it well. They actually synthesize their own. So when bacteria synthesize their own tryptophan, they, um, they do not use it. Uh, they don't take it up from the environment. They just make their own. So if we wanted to create 
uh, a bacteria that was oxytrophic, this would be a bacteria whose tryptophan operon or trip operon has been mutated. So the only way that that bacteria would be able to grow is if we added tryptophan to the media on which it was growing so that it would have tryptophan uh, to help make its uh, proteins. A prototroph would be the wild type of that organism whose trip, trip operon was not mutated. It's growing. Uh, it functions properly. Its gene is capable of producing what needs to be produced because there's no mutation. Now in mutations, let's talk about mutations. There are different types of mutations. The first type on spontaneous mutations are what we call base substitutions. And base substitutions result in three types of mutations, a missense, a nonsense, and a silent. Here in the top right, we have what's known as a missense mutation. In a missense mutation, we get a, a change in the amino acid sequence. So this A has been changed to a C. So the codon has gone from CAT to CCT. In this case, this codon in the wild type, wild type is uh, the properly functioning sequence. Okay. So in the wild type here, they should have a codon that encodes for histidine. But because a base substitution, we substituted the A with a C, I now have a different codon. This codon encodes for proline instead of histidine. When we have the primary sequence of a protein, if we put the wrong amino acid in the wrong place, this is going to ultimately trickle down to the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of our protein, meaning it will not fold properly and doesn't necessarily function properly. So in a missense mutation, a base substitution has resulted in a new amino acid. In the next type of base substitution, we have a nonsense mutation. The nonsense mutation is where we, again, we alter, right? This C has been replaced with a T. In doing that, what should have been a glutamine is now resulting in a stop codon. This is a truncated protein. So if the protein has been cut short, that's what truncated means, means cut off. So if the, the protein has been cut off or, or truncated, it'll not function at all. So nonsense mutations almost always result in a non-functional protein. A truncated mutation is what we would do if we were going to um, uh, actually do an induced mutation on purpose. We would add a stop codon. Uh, do a, a base substitution that would result in a stop codon so that the protein would not function at all and that's referred to as a knockout gene. We've knocked out the gene. The last is a silent mutation. In a silent mutation, we might replace um, one base with another base, but it results in the same amino acid. Go back to your uh, codon table from chapter seven and take a look and you'll see that most amino acids are actually encoded for by more than one uh, uh, codon. And if we have a mutation that occurs in the third position of a codon, most of the time it's not going to result in any kind of change in amino acid sequence. So in this case, we have a change in the genotype, but not a change in the phenotype. The next type of mutation is known as a frame shift mutation. Now in a frame shift mutation, this is due to the addition or deletion of a base. So we're actually changing the number of nucleotides in the actual gene itself, either increasing it or decreasing it. Now frame shift mutations are not always the result of a single base addition or deletion. Sometimes it can be a whole region, right? We can have an insertion of a small segment of DNA and that can result in a mutation as well. So uh, in a single base uh, insertion or deletion, or uh, we, could say, we could say addition or deletion, uh, here we have histidine being encoded for by CAT. But if a, um, if a base gets removed or if I move everything over by one, we just let's just say a base gets moved into here, right? So we move a base into here. And so if this gets inserted into here, that's going to shift everything over by one. And now those codons are completely different. It results in a totally different amino acid sequence. Most of the time it's not going to be functional or do anything. So that insertion essentially ends up deleting that gene as well. So this can happen through addition of a base or deletion of a base. And this is referred to as a reading frame mutation or frame shift mutation. We're shifting over that reading frame even though AUG started here, right? Our start codon, if AUG is here, 
it should be down here sorry it's a codon if AUG is here start codon is here and we insert a base in here this is going to throw my reading frame off and so again the codons are going to be different now the last spontaneous mutation is referred to uh, that we're referring to here is transposons and transposons uh, occur quite frequently quite frequently uh, there are lots of transposons in eukaryotic DNA and human DNA we have lots of transposons and these used to be referred to as jumping genes but they're regions of a genome that can hop from one part of a genome to another now in this is this process is referred to as transposition so we're moving trans like think transportation trans is movement and then so transposition we are moving the position of this particular uh, gene segment so instead of a single base pair moving around here we're going to move an entire segment uh, transposons are unique in their movement because they have very specific sequences on either end of this fragment so in here is a gene for some kind of transposon enzyme it'll get encoded for and it'll cut out uh, it's going to copy another gene so you can see here the transposon gets expressed so this gets transcribed and translated once this gets transcribed and translated it bends the DNA and actually copies a gene here and the transposase enzyme will cut the gene and insert its own gene into the middle of it this is going to disrupt this gene and introduce the transposon to a new position within the chromosome again this can occur in a, a close region of the chromosome just like one section to the other this can occur between uh, two different chromosomes in eukaryotic organisms this can also occur between uh, a chromosome a bacterial chromosome and a bacterial plasmid so these are small segments of DNA that are capable of moving from one region to another the transposon in addition to its own transposase enzyme within that gene segment will oftentimes contain other genes it all just depends on where these uh, start and end sequences actually occur on either side of the transposon so the transposon itself contains the gene for transposase but may have other gene material in it so it's it's much larger than that many times antibiotic resistance genes or genes for different toxins are also close to transposons so when they move that gene segment from one chromosomal region or one genome region to another they will bring with it antibiotic resistance or uh, toxin uh, virulence genes virulence factors induced mutations include uh, chemical mutations so induced mutations tend to be mutations that are introduced environmentally there are several different chemical mutations or, or excuse me chemical mutagens mutagen is the term for um, a compound that will induce a mutation uh, chemical mutagens can do things like modify bases they can create base analogs so we have a molecule that mimics a base but it's not quite a base uh, and then we have what are called intercalating agents transposons are considered spontaneous but they're also can fall into uh, induced mutations when they get introduced through a second pathway such as conjugation or transformation and then last we have radiation which is uh, light different wavelengths of light can of course have an effect on genetic makeup so when in part two of this lecture when we come back we are going to talk about induced mutations uh, and we will uh, cover some of the different chemicals and base analogs that are introduced environmentally as well as some of the light sources that um, that are induced mutations see you in the next one